Every couple of months, just pop along to a different spiritualist church in a different place, see what they were up to. And I started getting messages through, which were of the same nature, which I thought was interesting. And I was getting stuff about um, somebody from my past who died in a motorcycle accident. The only problem is, I don't know my past because I'm adopted. So, if it is somebody I know <laughs> that's trying to send me a message, it's not somebody that I'm, uh, you know, aware of. If it's it's in my past family of some description, I don't know them personally. Um, so, the other thing that I did once, um, just to give you one example, a friend of mine. Uh, Russell from London. We were driving along going to get some computer parts in Swansea and I saw a spiritualist church on the side of the road and I said, ah, the door's open. Spiritualist church. Hey, do you fancy a bit of fun? He'd never done it before. I said, let's go to the spiritualist church. He went, okay. Turned the car around. Went in there completely cold. Sat at the back of a room and we're talking a room that was probably about double this length and we sat at the back and I said to him, go in there and absolute poe face, nothing. Don't give anything away. Just sit there, don't smile, don't nod, and just ask a question in your mind and see what happens, okay? And don't react to what they say, you know? And he said, okay. So I asked a question about a friend of mine that had committed suicide, and uh, he asked about his mother in his head. I didn't know that at the time, but found out afterwards. And within about 20 seconds of me asking the question in my mind, the lady at the front, who would just see her sort of down the front, she said, People at the back have just come in. Um, one of you, I, I think you're asking about a friend who committed suicide, and uh, bang, started telling me details that were so spot on, and I just sat there and just went, okay, you know, and I was just sort of nodding and sort of, you know, not trying to give too much away. And then she said, and, and your friend beside you, um, your mother, uh, Elizabeth, born Liverpool way. And like, you know, I could go on about the things that was, was said. Very accurate. How did they know? Damn good magic trick if it was one. I'd love to know how that one was done. <laughs> but um, anyway, so my background is, I've had a lot of strange experiences. I've had ghosts, UFOs, uh, precognition, uh, strange things happening late at night, waking up from uh, sleep states and then stark awake in bed and then the dog would start barking even though I wasn't aware of what was going on. Uh, Poltergeistish type things, things banging on the window um, of the, the room and I would go out there and there was nobody there and I'd go and look over the wall and nobody could have escaped from there and it was a proper tap, it wasn't somebody throwing stones, you know, it was a proper bang 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 on the window. So you get this every once in a while. Um, Power of the mind, telekinesis. Um, one day, I was in a pretty angry state. Uh, I looked at a glass sphere, which is what, one of these things you get in um, fishermen's nets. And I previously, to, to preface this, I'd come out of a car. I was quite angry because I'd been cut up on the road and I'm a bit of an aggressive road monster myself, to be honest. And uh, so I was in a pretty state. And I've noticed a few times that my needles will go into the red on the car. And I'll go, I'm uptight, I'm uptight, calm down, calm down. And then I'll watch them and they'll go, Ooh, they all go back down. And I'm like, okay. So this has happened a few times, but anyway, this particular day it had happened. I walked up the stairs to the house, went in the back, back door, uh, back gate, sorry. And we have these fishing net things hanging out the back garden. And I don't know how to describe this, but I was intense inside my head and I looked I just looked at one of these things with an intensity and it just shattered, boof, like that in front of me. And I just, what the hell have I just seen? You know, I, I can't tell you how that happened, how I did that, but that happened. So, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things, if it happens to you, you'll believe it. You may not believe me, but I hope it happens to you one day. <laughs> so, um, the... Let's just keep a look at my notes and I've got to try and keep a good time here because we've got till uh, nine o'clock but I usually talk on for hours and I have to be sort of dragged off with one of those <laughs> things you get in the end. But um, Right, so from being a UFO investigator and I was appearing on radio shows, I was doing um, magazine work, I was doing um, lectures, 
around the place. I built up a bit of reputation, of, uh, reputation for myself and what I did in uh, 1991 when they were doing the Cardiff UFO conference is I actually saw a, a lecture by Colin Andrews. Now, even though I'd read books on the paranormal, I'd completely, somehow, missed out crop circles in these books. So I had all these books, I'd read about ghosts, Bigfoot, Yeti, um, all the sort of stuff, and I missed crop circles. And I don't know how I missed crop circles in these books. They were there, but I just sort of looked, oh, just sort of looked, what's that? You know, went past them. And I heard this talk by Colin Andrews, and I thought, how is he talking about this subject, which is so important? How is he talking about this? And I don't know anything about this. And I actually felt quite sort of put out, really, that I didn't know about crop circles, because I thought I knew quite a few things about the paranormal at the time. And I thought, how can he be talking about this? This is crazy stuff. This is, this, is, this is interesting. I like this. And the reason I liked it is because I thought, well, a ghost. You can't make a ghost happen on demand. You can't demand a ghost. You can't make a UFO come down when you want to. And what can you do to investigate these things? Well, a crop circle is there. It's actually there in the field, and it will remain, and you can go and have a look at it. So I thought, I'll go get myself down to Wiltshire and see these crop circles. So that's what I did. In 1991, I came down, started looking around, and I was looking for the signs that I was told you'd find in and around the fields. So I didn't come to the same conclusions. I'll just cut to the chase, because I don't want to make this a whole uh, talk about crop circles. I didn't come to the same conclusions as I was reading from some of the crop circle authors out there. I didn't think I was seeing quite the level of intricacy that was explained. I was seeing a lot of damage, a lot of breakages, and I tried to relate this to the crop circle people I was with, and I was saying, but you know, they kind of look a bit damaged. And, they, and these you know, well-established experts in crop circles were telling me, no, 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 you, you got that wrong, because you know, that's people who've just walked in the circle, and you weren't there early enough. So what we did is we started to get into the network of people that were hearing about the circles when they were appearing dead early. And we were driving around trying to catch them before anybody else had gone in them. And I went into the early circles and didn't find that they changed at all. They were still pretty much the same as you'd get later on in the day. So I started to think, you know, hang on a minute, this isn't right. And although I, I was dead set against the hoaxes at the time, I thought, oh, hoaxes, you know, and uh, I don't like using that term now because it's a very divisive sort of term, but you know, it was like the hoaxes, the bastards. <laughs> Masters, evil people, and I was one. I used to think it. I was exactly the same. I used to be sort of like, you know, yeah. If we could get them and stop them doing it, that'd be really good, you know. And we'll sort of, you know, we we actually used to drive around in cars with spotlights and infrared gear and all sorts of stuff, trying to track down these hoaxes. And eventually, we got to speak to some of them, and I changed my mind on finding them not too bad to speak to. You know, having interviewed lots of people in UFO cases and things like this, I found that the circle makers were very reserved because they thought they were going to get attacked, which is what they normally do when they meet people from the crop circle world, the research world, is that they attack circle makers and deny stuff. And I was kind of much more open-minded and I said, well, you know, go on, tell me, you know, and they were like, oh yeah, you researchers, and they were kind of, they were actually sort of quite negative towards me, and I thought, they don't really want to sort of give much up here, and I thought, I think they're right with what they say because they told me a number of things to look out for in the circles and I went away and I thought I think I think it is people I think it's people and I thought I can't really go saying that because it's going to upset a lot of the people that I know a lot of these researchers I've made friends with how can I how can I go around this now and I thought well you're playing a dangerous game here but what you should do is you should go out and try and make some circles and see what people think. Because there's, there was no way at that time that I was going to get taken out with circle making teams. They just wouldn't do it. You know, they wouldn't trust me. I was a researcher, you know, and, and they'd heard the stories about me chasing them down and with the torches and all this sort of stuff. So they were very reserved about it. And I thought the only way I'm going to kind of gain their trust really is by starting to make a couple of circles and seeing, you know, what happens, seeing whether people take them seriously.